I'll just say a few words about India's military, India's rise as a military power, and the Bombay incident really uh, highlights some of the difficulties, and then talk briefly about uh, how you actually approach these kinds of issues and what, what's necessary to do a good job in understanding and analyzing uh, you know, state power and the rise of such states as India. Uh, and, and, and developing st a strategy that, that's, that's useful for policymakers. Um, my current, in a sense, my current book is on India as a military power. And I'll just summarize it in a word or two. Not, I'm not, you know, certainly not going to use all the time allocated to me. And this will give us more time for Q&A. Uh, really, uh, the, I've discovered in writing this book uh, that the major theme in Indian politics and Indian security studies is that military modernization equals technology. And most of you are graduates of a technology institute, and I think you resonate and sympathize with that idea. But I've come to the conclusion, which we can debate perhaps here or when the book is published, uh, that that's the wrong approach. That simply having good technology does not get you very far in terms of having usable military power. Good technology is fun, it's shiny, it's nice, uh, it may be effective in tactical situations. But what really drives a, a state in terms of developing useful military power that is useful for political purposes is organization. And here, are, here is why I find India sort of in the middle of the pack, not the worst, but certainly not the best. And there has been a revolution in military organization, several revolutions over the past couple of decades. And I think that India is in the tail end of these, of these revolutions. Uh, the Indian Army, for example, is an army which, whose structure was invented or developed right around here in, in Madras by Lord Clive in the 18th century, and it, and it hasn't really changed very much since then. So it's an army of great organizational integrity, but an organization which goes back 300 to 300 years. In fact, the, the French invented the, the Seapoint system. And I think that's true of the Indian Navy and of the Indian Air Force. They're more modern organizations. They're effective in, in a limited context. But the thing that really is missing in India, as a, as, a, as, a, as a security specialist looking at it from the outside, is the other revolution that has not yet occurred here, and that's the revolution in military organization. And I think that technology is important, it's useful. Technology forces you to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. But the real difficult revolution is that of military organization. And of the three services, I think the Navy is clearly the best because it has models to follow around the world. It's not the best in terms of technology, but it's the best in terms of, 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 of how it matches up with its tasks. So the book, and uh, what, uh, the conclusions I draw from the book, or will be drawing from the book, is that as a military power, uh, the United States should not look to India you know, to provide huge numbers of infantry, you know, land, you know, armored forces, and so forth, but really that the Indians have to improve their own security. Uh, that is, the major military threat facing India is internal. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's turmoil in the districts. It's such things as terrorism, the Mumbai attacks. And here is where, so if an India focuses on these issues, it's going to have less time to play a larger global or even regional role using its military power. Yet on the other hand, uh, we also argue, I also argue that, uh, as Kishore pointed out, India and China in particular are rising states, and they're, they've benefited from the changes, from the stability of the international system. And they must find ways in which to, uh, in a sense, contribute to that stability. As I said yesterday, I think there are many ways in which India can work with the United States in dealing with problems that are not only bilateral or, or affect India alone, but really regional stability, regional security. And I see the Indian Navy going out uh, to uh, the Persian Gulf, even the Chinese Navy is now in the Persian Gulf, attempting to join the Western powers and some of the European powers in protecting shipping from, from, from piracy. I think we'll see more and more of that. That requires greater interaction between services. It requires political understanding between the leadership. Uh, and I look forward to the day, perhaps five, six, seven years from now, when both China and India are working together on these, on these tasks, along with the Americans and perhaps under a UN umbrella. Uh, until recently, the U.S. was allergic to the United Nations. I think the Obama administration will certainly change its approach to uh, working with the United Nations, working under the United Nations. The new U.S. ambassador to the U.N. is a colleague of mine at Brookings, 
and uh, Susan Rice, and I think she'll be a marvelous ambassador. And I suspect our policy will change and that we'll be more willing to join under a UN flag in various peacekeeping and other military-related operations. So I think that's, um, I, you know, you know, you know, in terms of Indian military transformation, I see this as less less rapid, but essentially kind of problem which is amenable to analysis discussion by Indians and looking around the world for best examples and best practices. The Israelis provide some good examples. The British are good. The Americans, of course, do some things pretty well. Singapore itself has a modern military organization and is learning how to do joint military operations and use military power for, in creative ways. The difficulty for India, of course, is that it's two major military... I have to be careful in my language. It's two potential military antagonists. China and Pakistan are both nuclear weapon states. And Indians have to understand the legacy of nuclear weapons. As long as the Americans had them and the Soviets had them and the Chinese had them, the prospect of a war between uh, the U.S., China, and, and the Soviet Union was very low because we knew the consequences. And I think that's true here, but uh, in a sense, it's still a learning process. And I see the Indian strategic community and the Pakistani strategic community slowly understanding what it means to be a nuclear weapon state. Let me, let me, let me turn now, and uh, my remarks will be very abbreviated, and talk, to, uh, talk about, in a sense, address the question that was raised offline uh, with some of, some of you about the IIT think tank, or think tanks in general, and what, what kind of work needs to be done in India to improve the quality of public policy, whether it's foreign policy or domestic policy, and in a sense tr try to provide my understanding of what a framework of a think tank is, in, uh, especially for Indian circumstances. And... Um, uh, although I don't do this very much, I should have had PowerPoint. I came up with five C's and one I. So C, 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 I. Five C's and one I. Um, when you're trying to gather brain power, and this room certainly has plenty of it, there's no question about it, uh, you simply want to get the best people you can, pick, you can afford. Uh, in India, there's no shortage of best people. There are a lot of them. And I think we've learned recently that in things such as software, the entertainment industry, even manufacturing, as I said yesterday, India can be world class. Indians can be world class. There's, there's no shortage of no shortage of, of brain power. But to get them harnessed and get them working on a, on a particular problem is, is not easy. Uh, secondly, um, a think tank or research institute, I'll use that larger term, really has to decide what kind of coverage it wants to have. Uh, in Washington, to use you know, the American scene as an example, we have two kinds of think tanks, those that cover everything and those that cover a single issue. And they're, they're quite different in their structure. Uh, the, the everything all-inclusive think tank would include Brookings, uh, would include to some degree the American Enterprise Institute and maybe Heritage Foundation. Yet these are three very different think tanks. Uh, Brookings is center, centrist, center, center moderate left perhaps, AEI is pro-big business, but also covers foreign policy. And Heritage covers everything, but from a conservative Republican perspective. So um, you have to decide whether you, the kind of think tank or research center you're going to support here will deal with all issues, foreign policy, or just domestic issues, or just education issues. And I notice in, in, the, in the seminars and programs you're having, offline from, from the plenary sessions, you do cover a range of subjects. And my advice would be, your free advice, except for what it's worth, is that the comprehensive think tank is better because it enables you to draw on expertise in different fields if you're addressing a particular problem. So there's not a single foreign policy issue that doesn't have a domestic political dimension to it, and vice versa. In a globalized world, you know, you have to cover education, economics, public policy, military strategy. So my, my inclination would be to advise Indians of setting up a think tank, you know, be comprehen as comprehensive as you, as you, as you can. 